been a while. Today, we're going to go behind the top 10 songs of this very same week from the year 1986. You know, if you need a break from the sheer insanity of the 2020s, got you covered. Hopping into the DeLorean and returning to the golden era of rock and roll. And after counting down the top 10 songs from uh, 37 years ago, we're going to re-rank them according to how much the world has listened to them since then. So by the end of this, we'll have an entirely new top 10 for you on this one. This time around, countdown contenders include uh, multiple movie soundtrack hits. There's a comeback single from a band who found new life in the neon decade. And not one, but two heavyweight rivalries between iconic bands and their former frontmen. Uh, it includes interviews and your stories as well. It's all coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you used to save your ticket stubs, all the concerts you've attended, you're going to dig this channel of straight musical nostalgia, especially today. Make sure you subscribe below right now to be a part of our, our music history daily, straight from the artists, the interviews. You can also become an honorary producer on our Patreon. Make sure to click on the link in the description. There's more content there. It helps to keep it a daily channel. Really pumped for this one. It's time for another edition of the Hit Song Redux, the show where we count down the top 10 songs on the Billboard Hot 100 from a specific week in the golden era of the rock and roll era. And then we re-rank them according to how many streams and views they have accumulated since then. For this episode, we're going back to the week of July 19th, 1986. As always, we include artist interviews, in-depth commentary, your stories and dedications as well. Speaking of dedications, I got to give a shout out to my personal hero, the great Casey Kasem, and his program, The American Top 40 Countdown. This show would not be possible without him. Never missed a week. So let's time travel back to the summer of 86 and soak in some pop culture context to get us ready for the countdown. So we're going to begin with what was playing on the big screen at the time. If you wanted to catch a movie, there were plenty of 80s classics to choose from. For example, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Bueller. Ferris Bueller. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Top Gun. Send you up against the best. Yes, sir. You two characters are going to Top Gun. And Karate Kid 2 were all hot tickets at this moment. Karate Kid Part 2. If you wanted to stay home and tune into some summer reruns, uh, you might have been watching Perfect Strangers. <laughs> MacGyver. or even growing paints. And of course, there's the Saturday morning cartoon uh, shuffle, including the adventures of the Gummy Bears. Gummy Bears. They are the gummy bears. Star Wars Ewoks and Droids Adventure Hour. If you had cable, you could also get G.I. Joe Real American Hero. How's that for a nostalgia bomb to start? Man, I miss the 80s. All right, let's get down to business. Coming in at number 10, it's the raspy voice UK rock star Rod Stewart with Love Touch. I wanna give you my love touch. Love Touch was actually one of Rod Stewart's biggest hits in the 80s. Uh, this song had him going full Romeo. track was written by a renowned songwriter, Holly Knight, in collaboration with Gene Black and Mike Chapman, who also produced it. Knight and Stewart were actually supposed to work on the song together, uh, but that partnership never materialized, which actually led to something of a disconnect between uh, the mighty Rod and Holly's visions. Man, Rod's for the song. Uh, Stewart approached it with a more tongue-in-cheek vibe, while Holly Knight wanted it to be uh, more sincere. Here's what Holly said about it in an interview I did with her. I played him the song and he literally jumped up and he goes, this was so funny. I felt like I was in like the, like the office of a, like a principal or a dean. And he goes, well done, young lady. And I thought, well, at least he likes it, right? Love Touch. Love Touch was used in the 1986 rom-com Legal Eagle starring Robert Redford and Deborah Winger. And although it was supposed to be the movie's theme, it uh, actually wasn't featured on the soundtrack. The music video features Stewart singing in a courtroom drama, further tying it to the movie. Hey, 
So coming in at the number nine spot, it's a nostalgic track that will have you wondering, uh, whatever happened to the one that got away? Talking about, we actually covered this a few months ago, Your Wildest Dreams by the Moody Blues. So Moody's lead singer Justin Hayward wrote this one after he was reminiscent about a long lost love. Uh, he said the song was about wondering what happened to the first girl you ever fell in love with. This would be a thought that he just couldn't leave alone. So decades after the fact, Justin Hayward actually tried to track this girl down. It was a shot in the dark. He had no idea what would happen if he found her, but he searched her out anyway. Justin has declined to share the details about what happened next, but cryptically described the experience as fantastic, amazing, and disturbing. <laughs> when asked for more details, he simply said he couldn't say anything more about it except that he would advise against doing it. So Your Wildest Dreams, it was a big MTV hit. Uh, the video received a lot of airplay. Music actually the Moody's biggest U.S. single since their 1972 reissue of Nights in White Satin. Nights in White Satin never Wildest Dreams peaked at number nine and spent 21 weeks on the Billboard chart, making it the longest run for any Moody Blues single ever. In your wildest dreams. The song also gave the group uh, some contemporary credibility. Justin Hayward would say that it was the first time in his career that he started getting recognized on the street. In your wildest dreams. Coming in at number eight, it's Mr. No More Love on the Run, Billy Ocean, with his hit, There'll Be Sad Songs to Make You Cry, parenthesis song. There'll be sad songs to make you cry. Uh, raised in England, Ocean worked as a session singer before getting signed by the GTO label as a solo artist. He didn't have any hits until the 80s, beginning in 1984 with his top 10 album, Suddenly. Of course, with the number one hit, Caribbean Queen, No More Love on the Run, another parenthesis song. The follow-up Love Zone will keep the party going with the Jewel of the Nile track. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Uh, for Love Zone, Billy Ocean worked with two producers, Barry J. Eastman and Wayne Braithwaite. And uh, Eastman would play a key role in creating the record's second single, There'll Be Sad Songs. I guess Eastman got the idea for the song from a story that his wife told him. A friend of hers was just getting over a difficult breakup, and while attending a party thrown by her new boyfriend, this friend heard Ocean's song Suddenly. Wake up and suddenly you're in love. Which reminded her of her ex-boyfriend, and I guess she broke down crying on the spot. And that story sparked the idea for There'll Be Sad Songs to Make You Cry. which of course was Billy Ocean's next hit, climbed to number one on the Billboard Hot 100, as well as number one on the R&B and adult contemporary charts. Man, he was so big in that time. I love you. As we get into the number seven position, I wanna recognize our sponsor, Zenni Eyewear, the glasses I always wear. You can customize your eyewear with a prescription lens or a non-prescription lens if you just want the unique look or color. Make sure to click up here, our info button, to get the best prices up to 80% off regular retail prices. All right, so at number seven, it's a movie ballad that every 80s kid knows by heart. If you don't, I don't think you were, you lived in the 80s. It's from The Karate Kid 2. It's Glory of Love by Peter Cetera. So The Glory of Love was Cetera's first solo single after leaving Chicago the year before. But before departing, Peter left Chicago with a series of iconic hits in the first half of the 80s. Talking hard habit to break. And you're the inspiration that both reached number three in the Hot 100. The also hard to see, I'm sorry. That went all the way to number one. So Satira was no stranger to mega hits when he launched his solo career. Of course, everyone knows the glory of love as the inseparable love theme from the Karate Kid 2. Of course, fit the movie just perfectly. Like a knight in shining armor, from a 
However, according to Cetera, uh, the song was originally slated for Rocky IV. Oh, you're gonna do it! What? <laughs> yeah, Rocky IV. How would that even work? Yo, Adrian, we did it all for the glory of love, probably, right? <laughs> Thankfully, the universe has a way of working these things out. So I guess there was a contractual dispute over the song, and it was dropped from the soundtrack at the last second. But only two weeks later, the people from Karate Kid 2 reached out to Cetera. You know, they were looking for a song. I don't know, maybe Glory of Love was Glory of Victory or something for Rocky IV. I don't know. It was meant to be for Karate Kid 2, though. <music> Decades later, in 2019, Cobra Kai revisited the song for the franchise, though uh, this time in name only. Glory of Love is the title for an episode in season two. You asking me out? What if I am? According to John Hurwitz, uh, one of the show's creators, they actually filmed a sequence with the song, but they had to cut it because the episode ran too long. Now they did, however, use uh, Chicago's You're the Inspiration as a consolation prize. You're the The Glory of Love was a smash hit going to number one on the Hot 100 and the USAC chart. It also went to number one in Canada and Sweden, and it was a hit in several other countries. You know, and our viewers had a lot of fond memories of this one. Said screen name, Ike621. I remember watching Karate Kid 2 so many times. I had a crush on Kumiko and loved seeing Okinawa in that movie. It wasn't until I joined the military and was stationed at a Kadena Air Base that I learned that the entire movie was filmed in Hawaii. I still visited many castles and listened to Gloria Love a few times while walking along at the beach. I, I remember going to, uh, actually it was my birthday party that year. I took all my friends and we went and saw Karate Kid 2 and uh, went out and bought the single the next day. Also screen name Rocketman VA703 said this, uh, I dated a wonderful girl in my senior year of high school. She was two grades below me though. When I went off to college several hours away, I thought it best for us just to be friends. Didn't want her to have to spend her junior year dating someone who she never actually got to see. But that spring break, things got rekindled and by Memorial Day, we were finally boyfriend and girlfriend. And our song that summer was Glory of Love by Peter Cetera. Sadly, things didn't work out, but I always think of her when the song comes on my radio. I'm sure there's many 80s kids out there that have the same reflection. So coming in at number six on this countdown, uh, it's actually another soundtrack entry. This is a blast from the past. It's Who's Johnny? A short circuit theme by Elda Barge. Johnny, said, you know you. So in 1978, Bunny DeBarge and her four brothers, L, Mark James, and Randy came together to form the family group DeBarge. They were signed to Motown Records the following year. You know, the group was marketed as successors to the Jackson 5. DeBarge released their debut album, The DeBarges, in March of 81, and their first Hot 100 single, I Like It, hit the airwaves in 1982. Two top 20 singles followed in 1983, All This Love and Time Will Reveal, making DeBarge one of the U.S.'s most popular acts for the team market. In 1985, though, the group scored their biggest hit, the number three Rhythm of the Night. Such an 80s classic. However, by this time, lead vocals Elda Barge had become synonymous with the group's name. And in February of 86, L decided to go solo. That essentially sabotaged the rest of the group. Who's Johnny was L's first solo single and his most successful. It climbed to number three in the Hot 100. The song was written by the husband and wife team Peter and Ina Wolf for the 1986 sci-fi comedy Short Circuit. Like I said, Get up. Short Circuit. I am alive. Short Circuit, of course, tells the story of an experimental military robot named Number Five, Johnny Five. It starred the Brat Pack's Ali Sheedy as well as the great Steve Gutenberg and also Fisher Stevens. I guess L was concerned that the song was too different from his usual work, but he gave it a shot, hoping the film would create some publicity for his debut album as a solo artist. It did. In addition to reaching number three on the Hot 100, Who's Johnny also went to number 10 on the U.S. dance chart, and it went to number one on the U.S. R&B chart, making it a triple threat. Oh, 
Okay, so we've made it halfway through the countdown. So much nostalgia, it hurts. At number five, it's the heartfelt ballad, Holding Back the Years by Simply Red. Yeah, you know, as I've gotten older, I've rediscovered songs from my past that have become deeper and much more meaningful than when I first heard them in my adolescence. Songs that didn't fully resonate with me back then because, you know, I was just too young. I just didn't have the, the life experience to take uh, the full emotional power of the song. Holding Back the Years is definitely one of those. This is candidly autobiographical for Simply Red's Mick Hucknall. He shares the pain of rejection and abandonment, hearkening back to his childhood when his mother walked out on him and his father, and I think he was only three years old at the time. His mother's departure left an emotional scar that never really healed. Mick confided that he didn't realize what holding back the years was really about until it was finished. He wrote it when he was just 17, by the way. As Mick Hucknall has said, this is straight from his heart. Holding back the years, as he would say, is about that moment when you know you have to leave your home to make your mark but the outside world is so scary. So you're holding back the years. I love that. Holding back the years. This song was a major success around the world. Um, the United States, of course, it went to number one, number four on the AC charts as well. I think also the cash box chart. It also went to number three in the Netherlands, number two in the UK, then went to number one in Ireland. This is such a powerfully emotional song, and our viewers had a lot of potent and meaningful memories tied to it as well. Here's what a few of them had to say about it. Screen name RCS527-1973 said, Holding Back the Years was my first exposure to Simply Red. I was at a friend's house. His father was a genuine music guy and listened to everything. I was sitting in my friend's living room when his father walked to the stereo and he played Holding Back the Years. I'll keep The tender lead vocal, it just really caught my attention, and I've been a fan ever since. Screen name Jennifer Clark 7907 said, Holding Back the Years is one of the songs that was always playing. I mean, I remember sitting at a Denny's at 2 a.m. after going to dance clubs in college. It was the lines, I wasted all my tears, wasted all those years being sung. I remember as I waited at an airport for someone, knowing the relationship was doomed and I needed to end it. Wasted all. This song is so laden with regret and sorrow when you really listen. And it's not just part of a background pop soft rock shuffle at a store or a diner. Very cool. Also screen name Drew the Unspoken says, uh, as a kid in the 80s, I had no idea of the weight of holding back the years. It was a pleasant song that would pop onto the radio while doing homework or cleaning my room. But listening to it now, he doesn't seem old enough to be carrying the emotional weight of that song but he does so beautifully, and I'm only feeling it now that I'm settling into middle age. It's so true, great comments. I mean, again, he was only 17 when he wrote it. Mick Hucknall just nailed it. One of the greatest songs ever. So heading into the number four spot, we've reached another box office hit song. This one's big. Talking about Danger Zone, the king of the movie soundtrack, Mr. Kenny Loggins from Top Gun. Top Gun, of course, a cultural phenomenon. And a big reason why uh, this soundtrack went to number one. From Danger Zone to Take My Breath Away to Heaven in Your Eyes to You've Lost That Love and Feeling to the Top Gun theme. This movie soundtrack was stacked with memorable songs. And of course, time has proven it to be one of the greatest of all time. It sold over 10 million copies in the U.S. and uh, I believe it's almost 15 million worldwide. I think uh, Maverick last year had a lot to do with that. Danger Zone, for its part, would reach number two on the Hot 100 and number four on the Cashbox chart. Here's what Kenny Loggins told me about this iconic song. They were already dropping music into the movie and they didn't have a voice for that. And so I asked Michael Dilbeck, uh, is it up-tempo? And he said, yeah. And I said, I'll do it. Because I've been writing nothing but ballads. Right. And I needed a rocker for my show. All right, for the number three slot, going to get a little nasty here. Written by one of the world's best-selling artists. Her first name ain't Baby. It's Janet. 
Miss Jackson, if you're nasty. It's Janet. Miss Jackson, if you're nasty. Nasty boys. Nasty was Janet's sophomore single from her breakout album, Control, one of the best pop albums ever, in my opinion. After Miss Jackson's first two albums eh, went fairly unnoticed, she teamed up with New Jack Swing architects and producers Jimmy Jam and Terry Loose, just legends for sure. Together, they delivered a blockbuster album that established Miss Jackson as a pop heavyweight. Nasty peaked at number three on the Hot 100 and number one on the R&B chart driving the album along with the help of four other top 10 singles to sales of over 5 million units. Nasty also ushered in Janet's new empowered persona and has become one of her signature songs. Here's what the great Jimmy Jam had to say about it. I don't know what made me put the snaps on the upbeat, but that's what gave it the swing. Well, this one did. Uh-huh, I know. Sing. And, you know, Terry always says, and, and we talk about it all the time, he always talks about that that was the first New Jack Swing song to him. So for our runner-up position, it's a song that boasts one of the quintessential music videos of the 80s, really the quintessential video of the 80s, written by former Genesis frontman Peter Gabriel, talking about Sledgehammer. You could have a steam train. Sledgehammer was released on April 21st, 86, as the lead single from Gabriel's seminal album, So, and it fittingly smashed the door open for Peter's mainstream success. Incredibly, the song was something of an afterthought. With the So recording sessions almost complete, Gabriel started tinkering with a new groove. Bassist Terry Levin remembered the band had packed up, they were ready to leave take off from the studio for good, Peter asked him to run through just one more song. Uh, the title, according to producer Daniel Lanois, came from uh, the tongue-in-cheek construction worker language they used throughout the sessions. I guess during the making of so, the guys would wear hard hats to you know, lighten the mood. And Lanois thinks that is what eventually inspired the tune. He said, then I quote, we had a bit of fun with the idea that we were turning up for work as if we were construction workers. And I'd always say, let's hit it with a sledgehammer. We get through the workday, and there were a lot of references to the sledgehammer. I think that's where Peter got the title. It's actually also about sex. Didn't know that for quite a few years. Of course, the music video, one of the most memorable the 80s ever, really. Pulling stop motion uh, animation. The shoot was both time-consuming and labor-intensive. It actually took over 100 hours to film. And Peter Gabriel effectively served as an animated model throughout. Frame by frame, he was directed how to position his body, his head, where to look, and even how to enunciate each part of the word that he was singing. I mean, at one point, Gabriel was locked into the same position for like six hours just to get 10 seconds of footage. That is dedication, crazy dedication to your art. And of course, a lot of viewers had great things to say about this one. Screen name Joseph Lasinski, 115, hope I said that right. He said, when we were kids, my brother would often film us lip syncing to popular songs at the time. And we were going to get more ambitious with making a video to Sledgehammer. He even put the word habit on a volleyball that I was supposed to kick. I kicked the habit. And I was supposed to wear an overcoat to take off or shed my skin. He also put a new and improved label on a bottle of detergent for this is the new stuff. <laughs> Laugh out loud, much fun memories. We never did make the video though. The word habit was taped to that volleyball for a long time. Screen name uh, ZP Freem said, my dad and I became friends after I moved out. It was based around music. We would go to record stores, concerts, and spend a lot of time listening to music together. Peter Gabriel went on tour for the Up album and I remember this very well, as it was one of the last concerts me and my dad went to before he got cancer and eventually passed. Sledgehammer was one of dad's favorite Peter Gabriel songs ever. Uh, my condolences, I, uh, such an amazing relationship uh, through music, fathers and sons. All right, we're finally here. We made it to number one. Remember back at number 10 when we started the countdown with Rod Stewart's Love Touch? Well, now at the other end, we have Invisible Touch. <laughs> Phil Collins was 
the 80s hit making machine, for sure. He turned in eight solo number one 80s hits on the Hot 100, including a couple from No Jacket Required, Susudio and One More Night, both in 1985. Phil's memoir, he said that if he was ever going to leave Genesis for a solo career, this would have been the time, coming off the massive success of No Jacket Required. But Phil admitted he missed working with Tony and Mike and genuinely enjoyed their company. So going back to Genesis, for him it was a no-brainer. Invisible Touch, uh, of course the album, was the band's 13th studio album and a commercial juggernaut. It went to number three in the US and spawned five, count them, five top five singles, including the title track. Collins said when working on the song, he started singing and the lyrics just came out. Collins would cite former relationships as inspiration for the song, saying that it describes someone dangerous and destabilizing. Further, he said, sometimes there are certain people that you're attracted to, but you're honestly better off without. And that's what this song is all about. Invisible Touch, the song, it rose to the top spot on the Hot 100 for a solitary week, only to be knocked off by today's runner-up Sledgehammer, the very next one. That hasn't happened very often in the history of music. That was fantastic. Well, there it is. That's the top 10 songs from this same week in 86. So let's go ahead and put them through our recalculation, our recalibration system. See who comes out on top, what the real top 10 is. I believe we're gonna have a new number one. But before we do that, actually, I wanna throw something into the mix here. I'm gonna throw in a couple of wild cards into this thing. Um, both of these songs were in the Hot 100 this very same week but they actually never broke into the top 10. They should have. Both come from Van Halen stock. This is gonna be fun. It's a post-1984 Van Halen grudge match between uh, Van Hagar, if you will, uh, the, the song Dreams, in one corner. And Diamond, David Lee Ross, or Yankee Rose, in the other corner. Now, originally, Dreams peaked at number 22, and uh, Yankee Rose uh, bested it going to number 16. But will history repeat itself? We'll find out in a second. Also, I asked about the rivalry, and we had some comments about that. Strong opinions on both sides anytime you talk about Van Halen and their lead singers. For example, screen name Ellen Dunn 559 said, My husband will never forgive Van Halen for hiring Sammy Hagar. Never. Conversely, screen name Sask Rider 2 said, while I enjoyed the good time style of the DLR era Van Halen, I respected the more serious tone of Sammy Hagar's era. Songwriting was just so much better with him on board. As for me, as I've said before, I appreciate both eras for different reasons. So does screen name user OW who said, I love both Roth and Hagar for their unique talents. It was just a transition period like the rest of life. Things change, people change. I don't have to love one and hate the other. I love them both. So now with the Van Halen rivalry thrown into the mix, let's recalibrate these 12 tracks and choose the top 10 for our Redux countdown. You know what? Right off the bat, we have a David Lee Roth sighting. Coming in at number 10, it's Yankee Rose with 30 million streams. So the question is now, will dreams do any better? Coming in at number nine and falling six spots from original ranking, it's Janet Jackson and Nasty with 35 million streams. This one hasn't fared nearly as well as some of her later work, but it's still one of her best known songs. Next at number eight, we've got Billy Ocean with There'll Be Sad Songs to Make You Cry, turning in more than a respectable 43 million streams. Coming in at number seven, it's the Moody Blues with your wildest dreams garnering 60 million streams. That also makes it Moody's second biggest song of all time. In, your wildest dreams. in at number six, the wait is over. It's Van Halen's Dreams with 82 million streams. Yeah. 
for those keeping track, that's 52 million streams better than Yankee Rose. Halfway through our redux, coming in at number five, we found our other rivalry, Gabriel versus Collins, and it's Peter Gabriel's Sledgehammer with 206 million streams. Actually really surprised that this one didn't get more, especially with the music video being the biggest, one of the, the best ever. Um, but you know, 206 million streams, still pretty impressive. As for Phil Collins, well, he's getting a little bit of uh, revenge today for getting knocked out of number one. It's because Invisible Touch takes the number four spot in our survey, edging out Sledgehammer with 221 million streams. So we're almost there, just a few songs left, showing in at number three, It's the Glory of Love by Peter Cetera, accumulating an impressive 377 million streams. Not bad for a Rocky IV reject. And number two is Simply Red's Holding Back the Years with 420 million streams. So the number one spot belongs to the soundtrack king, the movie soundtrack king, Mr. Kenny Loggins with Danger Zone. Danger Zone. Reaching the supersonic total of 605 million streams. Sure Maverick helped it a little bit from last year. So there it is, the new top 10 from this very same week in 86 based on all time streams and views. Let's do a little comparison to the present day top 10 to this, what do you think? Look, I got everybody wishing. Yeah. I hope you play your position. Yeah. I don't want nobody listening. Yeah. Take it right. Make sure to share your memories of these songs. What do you think about the new top 10? What do you think about it compared to today's music? What do you think about the rivalries, about Van Halen, about Genesis? Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Yeah.